Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel. Just stand with us as we sing. crossing over from death to life, and we're going to celebrate in baptism this morning. You may take a seat. Morning, church. Today is an awesome, awesome day as we come worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Man, it's so exciting uh, today to be able to tell you that Tracy, who came forward last week and gave her life to Jesus, is being obedient to the Lord in believer's baptism today. And that's just an awesome, awesome thing. And uh, we know that it makes the Father uh, so happy and so joyful. It pleases the Father when we're obedient to Him. And uh, so as Tracy takes a stand for Jesus today, who'll stand with her? She takes a stand for Christ. That's right. Tracy, as you take the stand for Jesus today, you see you have a host of friends and family that stand with you today. Isn't that an awesome sight? To know that we're not alone. Praise the Lord. Tracy, has there been a time in your life when you've repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ? Yes. Amen. It's my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Let's go ahead and while you're standing, turn and greet somebody in love of the Lord. Somebody you haven't said hello to yet today.
this time. One of our favorite things to do here at Emmanuel is to celebrate stories of people within our congregation who've just been changed by the love of Christ. So this time we're going to show you a video. Y'all can sit down for a minute. Here we go. Hey, I'm Corey Taylor, and I'm going to be a senior this year. Uh, the way God has really changed my life this summer, well, it's actually it's been a complete 180. Before the summer started, I just my eyes were completely not on God. I had distractions in my life that were completely keeping me away from what He wanted me to do. And I just, I was so scared of becoming a hypocrite that I kind of pushed God aside. But this summer, it, I learned that it's not about, it's not about what you've done, where you've been, it's where you're going. And God has really just taught me that we're all sinners, we're all here because we're sinners. And that, that doesn't label you. Um, before the summer, I kind of looked at Group 99 as a group that wasn't going anywhere, that I didn't want to be a part of a group that's not doing anything. But now, I feel honored to be a part of a group that's going to change the school, that's, that I can see changing and doing big things. And that's just the most exciting thing to me. Um, before World, World Changers, I, I was kind of nervous because going into it, I knew that I was going to have a good time, but I knew that I also wanted to come back and go back to the way I was living before. But that just kind of flipped completely on me. I realized that I can't continue what I'm doing, that I have to grow in Christ and I have to pull Him in and let Him work in me. And World Changers just really opened my eyes to that. They gonna know about us. So um, if, if you got a bulletin today, um, with, you should be able to open it and find in the middle a Love Loud document. It's really, really tiny and kind of hard to see. So put on your reading glasses and pull that out real fast. Let's put, fellas, can we pull up the lights real fast just so everybody can see that document? If you pull that out, wave it around for us a time or two. People say all the time, how can I get plugged in in church? How can I get involved in the community? I wish that we had a church that was doing something. I, we all just come and we sit at church. Let's do something. This is your opportunity. Love Loud is, a, is a, a, an opportunity for our church and every church's to just love on the community and share Christ. And if you look that document over, fill it out and slide it in the offering plate, that would be an awesome way for you to get involved. Now, this Tuesday, that Tuesday, not tomorrow, day after, there's going to be a meeting at 6 o'clock at Central Baptist Church. That's downtown, Central Baptist, Tuesday at 6 o'clock. You'll, you'll need to come to that meeting. Now, if you, don't, if you can't come to that meeting or whatever, that doesn't mean that you can't get involved in Love Loud, but it would sure help. So fill that, fill that form out, drop in the offering plate at, at the end of the service, and, uh, and get involved in Love Loud this year. Okay.
into your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever Just to, just to close yourself out. And just you and God to separate for a moment. Take an opportunity to press into Him. Just praise Him for who He is. Thank you for what he's done.
Father, do something in this place today that could only be explainable by the fact that you were here. Father, that when we open your word and your truth, that, that it would draw us all near to you by the blood of Christ. Father, that we would see what you've staked out for us in Jesus, that life everlasting is attainable only through the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for working within our people and for bringing revival into this place. That's not something we can schedule. It's not a, a time or a worship gathering, but instead it's something that only you can bring. Father, change our hearts today to be more like your son, Jesus. It's in your powerful name that we pray, and it's in your name that we sing. Amen. You all may be seated. You guys seen that movie before? That was, a, that was a request on me. I thought it was a pretty interesting part. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamrim vet ha'aris. In the beginning created God, the heavens and the earth. Embedded in the question... What happened to the dinosaurs is the question. Is the God of the Bible the one true God? Embedded in the question, what happened to the dinosaurs is can we trust the opening chapter of our Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 1? Is the existence of dinosaurs, does it change our view of creation and what are the implications and the issue of the theory of evolution for years ever since the beginning of time actually the bible has always been ahead of human discovery in the field of science for most of the world's existence Pioneers thought the world was flat. And yet, if they would have just read the Bible, they would have learned that the earth was not flat, but it was round. In Isaiah 40, verse 22, the Bible says, He sits a throne, enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. The Bible declares that this earth that we live on was a sphere, it was round, and that was way before humans found out that it was round. Well, the Bible also talks about dinosaurs long before we found any fossils. Number one on your outline, let's answer the questions, did dinosaurs exist? Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says, and God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind. The Hebrew word there for sea monsters, uh, the uh, King James renders whales, uh, the NIV renders creatures of the sea, is the Hebrew word tanin, which in other places in the Bible is translated dragons, and that is certainly a more accurate translation of chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, therefore, the reading is, and God created the great sea monsters, or, and God created the great dragons and every living creature. There are other places the Bible speaks of dragons in Psalm 74, verse 13, if you'd like to write that down. It was you who split open the sea by your power, speaking of God, you broke the heads of the monsters in the waters, and again, that's the word for dragon there. It was you, and this is on your outline. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan and gave him as food to the creatures of the desert. It's uh, been decades now where 
Bible scholars understand Leviathan was one of the dinosaurs that we've come to discover. Isaiah 27.1, again talking about Leviathan, says, In that day the Lord will punish with his sword the fierce and great powerful sword. Leviathan, the gliding serpent. Leviathan, the coiling serpent. He will slay the monster of the sea. Now, when you look at the word dinosaur, it actually it, it's limited to animals on land. Uh, but when we study dinosaurs, oftentimes uh, the sea monsters are also included and in those that fly in the, the very um, same category. In Isaiah 36, it speaks of the fiery flying serpent, another instance of dragons recorded in the Bible. Job 40, verse 15, if you'd like to turn there, it's the book right before Psalms. And Job 40, 15, Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible, if not the, uh, the oldest in terms of when it was written, not the age in which it writes about, but when it was written. Job writes, look at the behemoth, which I made along with, uh, excuse me, along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. So one man and dinosaurs were made at the same time. Verse 16, what strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. Uh, the sinews of his thighs are closed knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs like rods of iron. Uh, Job 40:19 40, says he ranks first among the works of God. Genesis 1, 21, the first things that were created that roamed. The land, yet his maker can approach him with his sword. The word dragon is mentioned multiple times in the Bible, in the Old Testament, at, at various places. And so some might say, well, if dinosaurs are not mentioned in the Bible, uh, then it, you know, the Bible is inaccurate, it's not, it doesn't disclose everything, it's not complete. But the word dinosaur wasn't even invented to 1841. It didn't, didn't come around. Before 1841, creation scientists will tell you we use the word dragons, and that's commonly accepted in every society uh, that's, that's ever been. And then in 1841, Sir Richard Owen found some artifacts, and he believed in the creation account, by the way. And, but when he found these artifacts, he coined the word dinosaur, uh, which uh, basically is a Greek word, uh, which, which means kind of a ferocious lizard uh, of sorts. And so he coined that word. And so prior to that, we called dinosaurs dragons. Uh, we can also look at many historical books and libraries around the world that chronicle dragons and describing them. And they describe them uh, in a similar fashion. They describe them in a way that would be congruent uh, with the descriptions that you and I have of dinosaurs and the artifacts uh, that we have found. So uh, then, then why, why would an evolutionist say, that, well, dinosaurs and man did not coexist. Well, it's because it does not agree with their belief uh, system. Their belief system, an evolutionist, is that dinosaurs and man did not coexist. They weren't on the earth at the same time. Despite what the evidence says, that they did coexist, that humans and dinosaurs were on this earth at the same time, but because it doesn't fit in their belief system, they reject it. Um, there's so much more literature uh, historical literature around the world. I'm just going to kind of mention a, a few of them, uh, but some of them date back even to the last hundred years. Uh, for example, uh, going back a little bit further, and we'll come to more modern day, Alexander the Great in 330 BC, his soldiers marched into India, and in India, uh, they worshiped a huge hissing reptile that they kept in caves. And the description and the pictures that were drawn are pictures that would depict what you and I would see at Smithsonian or a museum that we would call a dinosaur. China is renowned for their stories about dragons that you and I now call dinosaurs. There's pictures that's embroidered uh, on, on their uh, garments. It, their, the pictures are drawn on their pottery. And they go back hundreds and hundreds of years. In England uh, and several other cult cultures still retain the story of St. George who slayed the dragon that you and I would call a dinosaur. 10th century Irishman who wrote about his encounter with the Stegosaurus. In the 1500s, a European scientific book known as the Historia Animalum listed several living animals 
uh, that we would call dinosaurs. And it was a, a famous um, a gentleman, a naturalist uh, called U- Ulysses, who wrote about Baptista, who fought a dragon, a dinosaur, and killed it May 13th, 1572 in Italy. And so, so we have all this in literature, all these stories that, that were viewed as history uh, that we can look at, that dinosaurs and man coexisted for most of the world's existence. Uh, but let's say you think, man, all the literature is fabricated. Well, well then you, you have to begin to look at all the cave drawings, all the cave drawings that were drawn by man, that were drawn by humans. And what's so interesting, this uh, it, it's the, the hypocrisy is just so clear among evolutionists that they will look at cave drawings and if they have a big behemoth, they say, oh yeah, behemoths and man coexisted. But in the same cave, you'll have drawings of dinosaurs. And they'll say, but they didn't coexist. And so you see a duplicity. Why? Because it doesn't fit into their belief system. Uh, people down through the ages have become very familiar with the issue of dragons and the description fits those that we talk about as dinosaurs, plus the Bible mentions such creatures, I think we can come to a pretty quick conclusion uh, that dinosaurs did exist. I I hope probably most of us are beyond that, but but I do want to at least get to that point, that that dinosaurs uh, did exist. All right, so then I think the question is, number two, Roman numeral two on your outline, where did dinosaurs come from? If they did exist, where did they come from? Well, A, God created all things. In the beginning, created God, the heavens and the earth. And then in Genesis chapter 1, it begins to list on different days that they were created. Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says that he created all things, and all things were created by him and for him. So it was God who created the dinosaurs and this animal that we're talking about today. And uh, someone said, well, you know, why doesn't... The Bible speak, speak very explicitly about it. Why? Well, I think that it does. Well, then some might say, why doesn't it talk about all the different types of dinosaurs? Well, you know, the Bible doesn't mention cats either. <laughs> but do you believe cats exist? Yeah, they exist. They exist, and there's many different kinds of cats. But when we see a cat, we just call it a cat. When you see a dinosaur, you just call it a dinosaur. You don't necessarily talk about the different breeds of a dinosaur. So when, when did God create them? When did God create the dinosaurs? Letter B on your outline. Dinosaurs roamed the earth 6,000 years ago. God created dinosaurs the same day he created you and I. We read that in the book of Job. We read it in Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. That, that God created those, the sea monsters, the tenen, the, the dragons, these great monsters of old. And so he created them 6,000 years ago. And, and we see evidence because many of us say, man, they lived millions and millions of years ago. And yet, the more we discover, the more we learn that that was not so. In fact, in, uh, just recently uh, in Montana, there was a, a grand discovery by some scientists at Montana State University. They were working with a T-Rex they had found, and, and they cut the bone in two, and they found something when they cut that bone in two that has just blown the scientific world just, just the doors off its hinges. In that bone, they found blood and hemoglobin, which means that, 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 that fossil had not mineralized yet. Now, now, what that means to you and I as laymen is that it can't be that old. It cannot be millions and millions of years old because, in essence, that bone still has life in it. Scientists will say, oh, that, well, what happened was is there was a giant freeze, and it froze it, and, and then that's, that's what preserved it. But yet we understand, just using just basic science and biology, that freezing it wouldn't have done it either, that it wouldn't have calcified, that it couldn't have existed uh, these millions of years later. Um, unfossilized, duck-billed dinosaurs have been found in Alaska. Uh, similar things. Evolutionists will say they've frozen, but yet we understand with modern science that could not be the case uh, for these bones to survive all those millions of years and yet still have life in them. So what that tells us is that dinosaurs didn't exist millions of years ago. It was just thousands of years ago. Well, number three, let's move along. Where did dinosaurs go? Well, it, it's probably helpful to just give a quick discussion. Where did they go? 
it's helpful to, to begin looking at the ideal of uh, when they existed 6,000 years ago. The flood was about 4,500 years ago, and we're going to kind of talk about that. But prior to the flood, everybody was vegetarians. Before Adam and Eve sinned, there was nothing that died. Animals weren't killing each other. We were all vegetarians. It wasn't until after the flood that God said, okay, now you can eat meat. And we began to eat meat. And at that point, when sin came into the world and there was murder and, and, and we began to, to eat meat, uh, then we, we begin to understand why animals and humans cannot necessarily coexist if they're violent animals. But let me ask you this. When, when man is face-to-face with a violent animal, what is our experience? Man wins out. Eventually, that, that beast will be extinct. So where do they go? Genesis 6, 12, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles, if you're still in Genesis. In Genesis uh, 6, 12, uh, we read, God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the peoples. Now, in the Hebrew, that's the word flesh, not peoples. It's been translated to mean people on earth had corrupted their ways. When we begin to understand that as flesh, we understand that both man and animals became corrupt. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, the Bible says that the, that the whole earth groans. That, that when man fell, not only did man fail, and was there separation between God and man, but there's also separation between man and the earth, and between God and the earth. That's why when Jesus returns, there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven. And so uh, we read, because of this corruption, that God told Moses that he was going to flood the earth. So, so where, where did all the dinosaurs go? What, what about all these fossils? Well, the flood is the clearest account in the most rational way that can answer our question about dinosaurs. In order uh, for, for something to fossilize, it has to have a sudden impact. Now, evolutionists have said up until the last 20 years, oh, fossilization happens over a period of time. But that's not true. It has to be a catastrophic event all of a sudden in order for it to fossilize. Because if it's over a period of time, it basically decays and vanishes or it gets eight and there, there's nothing remains. So anytime you see a fossil, it's because of a catastrophic event that's taken place. And of course, the flood speaks to that uh, very issue. Also, every major civilization accounts for the flood story. And there, there's not a significant civilization that's ever been that doesn't chronicle the great flood. Some will give more details and, and some will give uh, varying details, but they all speak of a great flood, which would account for the billions of fossils that we find all over the earth. It had to be some catastrophic event that, that would have taken the whole world at one time. And so when the flood came and uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, basically you had avalanches and, and so all this sediment would cover up dinosaurs and other animals and other people, then it's during those times that basically uh, they would fossilize because they had a quick barrier. Well, let, let me speak just briefly to the issue of the flood and what we call the canopy theory. Because some scientists will ask, well, well how, where did all this water come from? How, how was there a flood so quick that it would flood the earth that, that quickly? Uh, well, w- one theory is the canopy theory. The Bible calls it the firmament. We read about it again in Genesis chapter 1. The, 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 the firmament is basically a moisture, uh, the moisture barrier in, in the atmosphere that went around the circumference of the earth. And, it, you know, there's speculation on, on how large this moisture barrier was. But let's begin to talk about the implications of this. And during, when it flooded, God just let all that fall down. And, it, and then the Bible says it came up from the springs. And, and basically all the water uh, had flooded the earth. So the canopy theory uh, basically uh, points out to us that during that time uh, period, uh, the temperature was all the same. It, it didn't get real hot. It didn't get real cold. It, it never rained. There were no clouds before the flood that we read about in Genesis and Noah's day. And, and so this canopy created a, a barrier that allowed people to live longer. 
You didn't have, uh, it was one of the reasons why animals lived longer. Um, th- there was better oxygenation in the atmosphere. And we know, again, from just uh, science, that the more oxygen that an animal has, even insects, the larger they'll grow. And so during this time, you have animals that are living longer, and you have animals that are growing larger. For example, a crocodile. And you know, most reptiles, in fact, in particular a crocodile, which is a form of a dragon, it grows its entire life. It never stops growing and getting bigger. They'll live anywhere between 70 and 100 years, and, and they'll get up to maybe 2,000 pounds, uh, 2,500 pounds, and they just continue uh, to grow. Well, imagine all of a sudden if that crocodile is living 500 years. What if it's living 1,000 years? And it just continues to grow. And so with the canopy theory, nothing died before the fall. Every, every, nothing had an, uh, a death because we can read in Genesis chapter 3 that God killed the first animal. It wasn't until then and then uh, people were still living a long time. Animals were living a long time. And animals just continued to grow and to get larger. It was also, uh, the canopy theory, um, helps give answers to the fact that the sun was 30% dimmer, uh, which gives credence and which science has uncovered. All right, let's move on to A. What about the ark then? Okay, there, there was this great flood. Uh, we understand that there's a lot of history, not only in the Bible, but even outside extra biblical data that proves there was a flood. Uh, we can understand that the flood caused things to fossilize quickly. It accounts for all the fossils all around the world being fossilized at the same time. But how, what happened to the dinosaurs on the ark? Did they get on the ark? How, how could they fit on the ark? Let's talk about that. In Genesis chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, uh, God told Noah that we're going to have two of every kind on the boat, and then we're going to have seven of every clean kind of animal. And so some came in pairs, some came in sevens. Birds came in seven on the ark. So I know we see these pictures of Noah's ark, and they're coming on two by two, and certainly some of them came on two by two, but some it was seven and seven. Uh, And you can read about that in Genesis 7, verses 2 and 3, and then verses 8 through 9. And so we read about them, and, and we understand there was no exception. All animals came on the ark. So that would mean there would be dinosaurs on the ark. Uh, There would have been ample room on the ark for dinosaurs, as we understand in a science that disclosed dinosaurs uh, to us. Uh, Part of the reason how they would fit, there was ample room, but you can imagine that they were young adults brought on the ark. You wouldn't bring on animals that maybe were past childbearing. You'd bring on animals that that were young, that had uh, most of of their life span ahead of them to reproduce and and to repopulate the earth. So they would be young and they would uh, be smaller in nature. Well, what happened to the land animals uh, that didn't go on the ark? Well, they drowned. Uh, They would drown as as well as uh, other humans and other animals, and and they were quickly buried uh, during that uh, time. Um, another way we can see how they would fit on the ark is the size of a dinosaur's egg. The largest dinosaur egg we've ever found is the size of a football. So, so dinosaurs, when they were first hatched, they were pretty small. And most of us think of dinosaurs as kind of like the T-Rex and some of these other large dinosaurs. But most, the average dinosaur was the size of a sheep. And of, of all the discoveries we've found, of all the fossils we've had, we like seeing the big dinosaurs in the movies and in the museums. But the vast number of dinosaurs are about the size of sheep, and they, go, the, the, they were small as a chicken. And so, yeah, they could have fed, fit on the ark, even the largest of the dinosaurs. When they come out of an egg the size of a football, yeah, that'd be pretty small and could easily have fit on the ark. Uh, well, the flood of Noah happened 4,500 years ago. So we can safely say that, that we coexisted with dinosaurs even up to 4,500 years ago and that they roamed the earth uh, at the same time as we uh, were here on this earth. Uh, so um, dinosaurs would lay these eggs and begin to populate the earth. And so then the question becomes, okay, Many of them got on the ark, they got off the ark, 
and they began to populate the earth. So then, and why are they extinct? And they should still be here, right? Well, maybe so, and, and maybe no. Animals become extinct all the time. Virtually every year, an animal becomes extinct. And so the idea of dinosaurs becoming extinct in just 4,500 years should not be beyond reasoning. In fact, we've seen it in our lifetime, uh, animals becoming extinct, including dinosaurs. And you can just imagine in a post-flood world, with all the sin, with the, the canopy being gone, and the atmosphere, and, and, and think about the competition for food. Food that was no longer in abundance, the competition for the food, other catastrophes, man hunting for food, or perhaps just for sport. We do that today, white, right? The, the white rhino and, and elephants for their ivory uh, in places have become extinct because of man just hunting for fun. The destruction of their habitats. Many species have died out. So it's not too far-fetched to think that dinosaurs also went extinct. Letter C. Some could still exist. In fact, I would argue that some still do. Uh, there are scientists who believe uh, a few dinosaurs have survived to this day, and, and we're still discovering every day new animals, and we're discovering new plants. I mean, in the world that we live in, in the United States, we think every corner of the globe has been searched and discovered, and it's not. We still haven't reached the depths of our seas or the inner, inner parts of our jungles in the Amazon and the, the Congo, uh, that there's many parts still undiscovered. And I think if we're intellectually honest, nobody can really prove that something is extinct unless they can view the entire world simultaneously in every inch of that world and say, yeah, right, it doesn't exist. It's no longer here. In fact, scientists have been embarrassed more than once. In the 1990s in Nepal, uh, there was an elephant that they thought was extinct that they actually found. And it looks much like the woolly mammoth. And it had a lot of the features. In Australia, uh, just within our lifetime, again, scientists embarrassed. They thought uh, the living trees that they're called were, had, had been extinct with the dinosaurs. And yet they found some still in existence. They were not extinct. Explorers and natives in Africa have had dinosaur sightings, even in our, uh, this last century, in the 20th century, deep into the Congo, that fits our description of dinosaurs. So what does it matter? What does it matter? Okay, listen, we can talk about uh, dinosaurs. We see the, the, the Bible is reliable. We understand that when we discover something, and, and it's like we, we think it contradicts the Bible, what we need to do is dig in just a little bit deeper. Just like the world uh, thought the earth that we lived on was flat, but the Bible said it was always round, Listen, we could have dis discovered dinosaurs thousands of years ago if we just read the Bible. You can look at literature. Everything points that we coexisted. And if we coexisted, then dinosaurs are not millions of years old. And if dinosaurs are not millions of years old, like scientists have told us for so long, could it be that the earth is not millions of years old? Well, certainly it could. There was an event that, that happened uh, back in, I think it was the 80s, when Mount St. Helens erupted out in the western part of the United States. And the huge flume went up and engulfed cities. And it was weeks before anybody could get in and really see if there were survivors. And then scientists came in shortly thereafter. And, and they, they made a, a discovery that has changed the way we date how old something is like nothing else in our lifetime. And what they discovered is because of this catastrophic event of, of this earthquake or this, this volcano eruption, that when they went in and they began to look at the layers that the volcano erupted and they used their scientific dating formulas, that that which literally took hours and maybe a day to create, their dating said it would have been millions of years old. See, you and I, when we dig up a dinosaur bone, <laughs> It doesn't have a tag on it with the date of when it was created. And so we, we try to find ways to date things. And what the eruption of Mount St. Helen and the preceding investigation 
show that our dating methods aren't right. Once again, proving that this earth isn't as old as what some scientists would lead us to believe. That God did create the world in six days. That God did create you and God did create me. So what does it matter? Well, it matters because the flood, which was true, which helps prove the existence of dinosaurs and what happened to them and why we don't have as many as what we think we would if we coexisted, it shows us that God does judge sin, that there are consequences in this life, and that death is real, and there, there will come a day when you do not exist on this earth. For some of us, it will be sooner than we think. And the only thing that will matter is if we've trusted in the God of the Bible. Can you, can you get beyond your disbelief and your skepticism to go all in with the creator God who's never been proven wrong? That the Bible from Genesis to Revelation has always proven to be 100% accurate. It's a decision you'll never regret. It's a decision you'll never be proved wrong. As we look at the account of the dinosaurs, the implications are huge. They're larger than the little time that I have here to explain. But let let me just finish our time together talking about the implications of it on the issue of atonement. When we talk about atonement in Scripture, we're talking about that Jesus paid for our sins. His blood was shed to pay for our sins. The first time we read about the atonement is in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve had sinned. God comes into the garden and says, where are you? Like God didn't know where they were at. See, God was wanting Adam and Eve to see how far they had traveled from him in relationship to him. And God makes the first sacrifice. The Bible says that he, he killed an animal and he, he covered them with its skin. Foreshadowing what Christ would do. Just as God covered the shame of Adam and Eve in their sin, so God in Christ Jesus covers our sin and our shame through his blood. And if dinosaurs, for some reason, had existed, and we know they haven't, but if they did exist, then something died before Adam and Eve, before the fall, and that there was sin before the fall. But the Bible clearly teaches that there's not. My friends, this is, this is why it matters to you. Because one day you will stand before a holy God. And the only thing that will matter is if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. God will judge sin. He judged in Adam and Eve and they eventually died. He judged it in the time of Noah. And most of the earth was wiped out because of the consequence of their sin. But you know the good news in each of those cases? There was a glimpse of a gospel. In Adam and Eve, it was the skin that that God created through the death of an animal. In Noah, it was the rainbow, the sign of the covenant. And that God would never flood the earth again. Have you trusted him? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, God, as we come to you and and God, we're so thankful, God, that we can trust you, that we can trust the Bible, that your word is uh, reliable, that it is without flaw, and that God, we know that God, when we have something we disagree with about the Bible, that we're wrong, it's not that the Bible's wrong, God, we understand that the, that the Bible interprets culture. The culture doesn't interpret the Bible. And God, perhaps there, there are folks here today that don't know you. God, I pray that during this time of invitation, God, that they would turn to you in faith. And they'd give their lives to you. God, over and over again, God, you prove that you're God. And you have revealed yourself in Scripture. God, let us trust in that promise. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask counselors to come down front. And friend, you come today to join this church, to get right with God, to give your life to Him, maybe to pray at this altar. As we sing, you come just as you are. You come.
peacekeeper, you finish what you begin. say yes to him today as others have when you respond to him today you come as we sing as we worship say yes to him whatever that is whatever that might mean you come now
you have promised you will never leave us nor forsake us. And God, in that we rejoice and say amen. Man, you may have a seat. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you just a little bit of what God's doing. I'm going to invite Alex to come up here. Alex, man, he's been uh, with us now for a while and has been partnering with us in the gospel. And God has just led him here today uh, to officially say this is where God's calling him. And so will you covenant with Alex today? Amen. As he does with us. Challenge him, encourage him as he does us. Amen. Welcome, brother. I'm going to ask you to have a seat at the end. Would you stand back up here? I'm going to invite you to come and, and encourage Alex. He's made this step of faith. Uh, as the ushers come forward, I'm going to ask you to prepare for the offering today. And I want to give you a, an opportunity uh, for a mission trip that just kind of came on us this past week. Many of you were here when Lonnie Riley uh, preached about the cookie dough a couple months ago. He has a vibrant ministry in eastern Kentucky uh, that God has just used uh, to, to shape the lives of so many people. And one of the ministries they have is they have an archery ministry where they bring in kids from counties and allow them to compete in archery and have prizes uh, for the kids when they win. And, and then they share the gospel. Uh, the last one they had just two months ago, they had six uh, give their life to Jesus. And so if you would like to be a part of that ministry, this is short notice, but hey, well, that's just kind of people we are here to main. We'll just, when God speaks, we go, right? God doesn't always give us a lot of warning, and we're okay with that. You can write on your communication card, just tear it out of the bulletin, or at the back table, Derek Smith. Derek, could you go ahead and make your way back there? He's going to be back there, and you can give your name to him. You can come and help cook. You can come and just love on the kids, or you can come and help with the archery which means we'll give instructions, and your, your purpose is to make sure nobody gets shot with an arrow, only the target, okay? And so it's Saturday afternoon up to early evening, a great opportunity, and that's uh, my right, uh, your left as you exit. If you want to go ask more questions, you can. But prayerfully consider, we need about 12 or 15 to help them make this happen, and so prayerfully consider that. Pastor Dustin. Now, now, I know what some of you new people are thinking, like this is your first time at Emmanuel, and you're like, man, who preaches on dinosaurs? I know what you're thinking. Listen, we did this poll on the interweb, and we let you people, they sent in questions, and then everybody voted on them, and dinosaurs was one of the top pick choices. So, so don't think it's strange that we talked about dinosaurs today. I thought Al did a great job on tying all that in together. So, and coming up next, if you've noticed... Ghostbusters versus Long Island Medium. I mean, listen, folks, I'm not going to tell you what all that's about, but I, I bet deep down you're like, Ghostbusters, bringing back my childhood, right? You see, so, so bring people in to, to listen to these things, and then the cage match, somebody may get hurt up in that thing. I don't know about that, so you definitely don't want to miss that thing. Now, students, we've got Hearts on Fire coming up, okay? If you want to go ahead and get your deposit to, to me, that helps us just lock in the spots. We've ordered 90 tickets. We want to buy more, but we won't be able to determine that unless you jump on board and help pay the deposit now. If you need work, let us know. We'll get you hooked up with somebody. Folks, if you have never heard of Tim Hawkins, you need to go on the 2BU, okay, and prime your funny pump, okay, because he's going to be here at a manual. Let me tell you all something. This place is going to sell out. This place we're going to sell out, so you want to go online and check it out. Everywhere the man goes, okay, you need to make sure you use the bathroom before you watch YouTube videos. Before, everywhere this man goes, sells out. So you don't want to be one of those persons, well, that's my church and I can't get a ticket. It's because you waited, it's because you waited. So throw that out there to you. And also, hey, if you want to help out with the corn maze, pumpkin patch, you got a meeting this week, a lot going down this week, corn maze, pumpkin patch, and as Brent said earlier, love loud. So I just want to throw that out there to you guys. Listen, we love you. We're glad you're here. Hang around, shake hands, get to know one another after the service. And uh, again, we're grateful you came to worship God with us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to see what your word has to say about a scientific, it seems, only topic. But in reality, we know, Lord, that it's in there. And I'm thankful that you allowed Alan 
to show us what your word says about dinosaurs, the things that we grew up with, and there was always a mystery there. But today we know that the mystery is explained, and we thank you for that. And we thank you that your Bible is reliable and that it brings some to salvation. We thank you for the testimony that we saw on video today, Lord, that it would reach out into this area and spur students and adults and children on, Lord, to follow you and that you are real and that you do change people's lives and, and Lord, people can actually know and see it in others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.